Hi there. Welcome to The Preventable, the podcast giving you a seat at the table with conversations about the intersection of alcohol, drugs, and mental health in everyday lives. Take a seat and join us. Welcome to The Preventable. Back with me is Jessica Leahy, author of The Addiction Inoculation, and technically she never left. We just had so much (laughs) to talk about that we just keep talking. So in the last episode, um, we were talking about the fact that you're very open and honest about your own sobriety journey, your your own story. And I mentioned that that's a huge part of what you advocate for in the book is Mm -hmm. being honest with your kids. Um, that I think I just have to tell you, that is the most, um, that's the thing that resonated with me the most because I have situations in my family where this is what I do for a living. Right. And yet there are some secrets that people Mm -hmm. are keeping in the closet and I'm wanting to open the closet and like, let's talk about it. And that's not where everybody wants to go. Yeah, it was really scary writing this book, mainly because, you know, while it's a, quote, open secret in my family that I grew up in, uh, you know, that there's uh, addiction, alcoholism, substance use disorder throughout my family tree, you know, now I'm putting it out there nationally. And that was scary for me. But what I realized was, is that you know, yes, I have um, a substance use disorder hanging around genetically, but what I think was most damaging for me was being gaslit as a kid about what I knew I was perceiving in my own family. And yet my sister and I would sort of tag team each other like, okay, it's your turn to bring it up. No, 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 it's your turn to bring it up. And we'd bring up, you know, that our parent seemed to be having a problem and the other parent um, would, you know, say, no, no, that's not what you're seeing. You misunderstand, blah, blah, blah. And gaslighting is such an emotionally damaging thing to do, especially to children. I'm sorry, sweetie. The perception that you think you're having about the world is incorrect. Let me substitute my story for what you, what you are actually perceiving. It's just really damaging to do to kids. So the secrecy not being allowed to talk about this thing that, you know, there's a saying in 12 step that our secrets keep us sick. And and that's, that's true. It really is true. And my husband actually is an infectious diseases physician. And there was a really cool study that showed among patients who had HIV, um, they sort of broke them up into two groups. One group kept it a secret, their HIV status a secret. The other group did not. And the group that kept it a secret had poorer outcomes, health outcomes than the ones that were open about their status. Um, and, And a lot of that comes down to, you know, your Brene Brown sort of shame and all that sort of stuff that, you know, weighs so heavily on us. Shame and guilt and fear. Those are all things that do make us sick. You know, they suppress our immune system, that negative Um, all that negativity, you know, can do, you know, whether that's loneliness, whether that's isolation, whether that's shame, all of these things um, can make us sick. There's actual, you know, evidence to show this. So you say um, pretending that things are not as they seem, that you don't see what you do see, that you don't hear what you do hear makes children crazy. The first step is not in repeating the mistakes of generation. The first step in not repeating the mistakes of generations past is to know and use honest language, whether it's an elephant or mommy's inability to stop drinking wine. Like Mm -hmm. that to me, I was just like, boom. Yeah. You know, and, and then you go on in this same chapter, you're talking about a, a young man named Jarrett and how when his family came out and told him what was really going on with his mom, that he said, I knew in that moment when my grandfather told me the plain truth that life wouldn't be the same for me. And it didn't change the circumstances, Mm -hmm. but it shifted my perspective, right? That that's, and I I know that that was, that was from Jarrett himself. And, Mm -hmm. and uh, it's like, 
yes. Yes. Like, Susan, you just have to speak the truth. I right. mean, I was like snapping yeah. and I was like, yes. Well, for so many reasons. I mean, and, and the elephant that I'm, that was in that quote that you mentioned, yes. that actually comes from Susan Cheever, her father, John Cheever, amazing writer, incredible writer, massive, um, uh, alcoholic. And she writes in a couple of her books actually are about growing up in a family with, um, substance use disorder. She refers to it as that elephant in the room, you know, the thing yeah. that we're never, it's stomping all over our our family, it's wreaking havoc, yet we're never allowed to point to it and say, hey, that's an elephant. That's and an elephant. Everyone, exactly. And everyone's <laughs> saying, no, 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 it's something else. Don't, you know, it's the, don't see that thing. And I'm you telling know, that, you, that's an elephant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that can be really, um, just having to avoid that and not talk about it was, you know, part of what was so upsetting. And so that's the last thing I wanted for my kids. So we talk about, we talk about substance use disorder a lot because we can't afford not to because my kids are at higher risk. Um, you know, what we know these days is that um, genetics are about 60 to 70 uh, or about 50 to 60 percent of the risk picture. And then the rest has to do with, you know, adverse childhood experiences and all kinds of other small things I talk about in the book. Um, but that I can't, I do not have the luxury. No one really has the luxury to, to say, oh, this could never happen to my kid. Uh, but my kids are, as I said, are at a heightened risk for that. So we have to, we have to talk about it. I had a conversation about it actually today. I have a kid going, my youngest kid's going off to college in mm -hmm. less than two weeks. Um, and you started scratching your neck. How's it? How are you feeling about that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's, this is not the first kid I've sent off to college, but it is, you know, it's time for another conversation. And especially the summer before sending a kid off to college, I hear a lot of parents say, you know, this is the last gasp. This is the chance for me to like get all those conversations in, but you can't start there. I mean, this has to be a conversation that starts really, really young. And in addiction inoculation, I talk about the fact that this is a conversation that actually starts in preschool and kindergarten. And that's right. Um, with, and that's, one of the things I hear a lot from parents is that this is a really challenging conversation. So please, could I give them scripts for things exactly. to talk about? People always say, like, just <laughs> yeah. give me talking points. Yeah. Just tell me what to say. Yeah, exactly. And if that makes it easier, I'm happy to do it. And so starting in preschool, kindergarten, all the way up through college, there's a chapter in the book on college. And at first I wasn't even going to write that chapter because I'm like, well, you know, those alcohol in college are so inextricably linked. Like people will just laugh at me if I say right. that there are ways to talk about, um, you know, going to college and not indulging, you know, excessively. And uh, it turns out that I was absolutely wrong. That's a myth. There's that a far, far fewer kids actually are drinking in college than we have been led to understand. But the media tends to skew our, lots of things tend to skew our, our, our vision of that, whether that's the media or, um, they're actually parts of our, the way we understand the world, our brain tends to um, trick us sometimes. And I get into that in the book as well, so that we can help kids understand from a place of real information and not myths. Um, we know that scared straight doesn't work. We know that fear mongering doesn't work. Um, in fact, when I wrote an article back when I was writing a column in the New York Times about, um, I asked my kids at the rehab, my students at the rehab, um, what in your most open moment could an adult have said to you that you might've actually listened to that might've not necessarily, you know, ma suddenly made you well, oh, but sure. change your thinking. And all of them said real honest information, because when people would say things like drugs are bad, well, that can't possibly be true because why would people take them? What's the if they're just bad, then no one would take them ever. So um, using those sort of scare tactics, we know those don't work. Um, and what does work is giving kids actual real information, giving them the benefit of the doubt that they can actually make some good decisions and help them understand why drugs and alcohol are different, operate differently in an adolescent brain and body than they do in an adult brain and body. And that the longer we can delay use, the lower we can get kids' chances of having substance use disorder during their lifetime. So the, the younger a kid is when they first try drugs and alcohol, the higher their lifelong risk of, of dealing with substance use disorder over their lifetime. So it's all, a, it's all delay, delay, delay. No, I'm not just being some, um, you know, teetotaler. 
um, Pollyanna, here are the actual pieces of evidence to show what happens in the brain, what happens in the body, how we're damaging the brain when the brain is in this incredibly robust time of change and cognitive development and why it's so important to wait until that period of development is completed. Um, and if you give kids and parents that information, especially if you give kids that information, it can help shift their how they weigh pros and cons. And that's exactly. really how what they we need make to do. decisions as right. their prefrontal cortex is trying to figure out what to do with all of this mm -hmm. information that it's being bombarded with. And, well, and a lot of people oh, say this in crazy dumb thing, which is, oh, kids just don't understand the consequences of their actions, which is not true. That is not true. In fact, what we know about the adolescent brain is they do understand consequences, um, you know, action consequence. However, they tend to weigh the positive, the possible positive, the potential positive benefits heavier than they weigh the possible negative benefits. So when we help them understand the possible negative benefits, it can shift that um, that balance a little bit. So it's it is important that they get real honest information rather than you know stories. And I I love that you really emphasize with something that we emphasize, which not only are these conversations just one and done, right? Mm -hmm. Where you're having one sit down right. conversation and then it's like, okay, like the sex talk or <laughs> right. like the, you know, um, but they do begin early right. and they're age appropriate as you go along. So with younger kids, you know, of course you are talking about like, what is a grown up? Like, what does mm -hmm. that even mean to be a grown up? Like, that's a grown up drink. Like, what what does that really mean? Like, how old do you have to be? Right. And then and then, like, of course, at college age, that conversation is very different. Middle school, to go back to what we were talking about before. I mean, that's really where you're like kind of leaning into the gross out factor. Right. You know, you're sort of like into the peer influence piece and you don't have to give it away. But I was crying laughing when you were describing your hot ones. <laughs> uh, experience because I'm like, yes, this is a woman who has two teenage boys who knows what's like hip and is also like not afraid to, to have fun with mm -hmm. these conversations. Like the, there, it's not all so serious where it's like, it, it, it can't be right. Because life is not this serious. I mean, it is, but it's mm -hmm. also like, Hey, this is awkward. And let's embrace the awkward. Yeah. And let's embrace how weird this is that we're talking about this and let's let's have fun with it. Yeah, I, I think that laughing the, so hard. The thing I've learned both as a parent as a, and as a teacher is that when you say things like we need to have a talk or okay, sweetie, Ugh. here's you know, <laughs> we need to have a family meeting and you know, these sort of like when you frame it in terms of here it comes, that can be, dun, dun, you know, dun, dun, dun. right. And, you know, they'll shut their brains off, things like that. So the hot ones um, the thing that you're talking about actually is an excerpt that ran in the Washington Post. So I'll send you the link so that you can link it for your listeners. That would be great. Um, but it was really fun. The show Hot Ones, the basic idea is that Sean Evans, the host, uh, uh, gives the celebrities that he interviews increasingly hot uh, chicken wings or vegan wings. And there's 10 of them. There's 10 questions, 10 wings. They get hotter as they go along till essentially they're basically crying. They're so hot. And yeah. so we, we've always really liked that show because it works. He gets people off balance because it's their mouths are burning and you know, they're on fire. So, right. So <laughs> I purchased the sauces that he uses on the show and I got unseasoned wings and some vegan wings and we tossed them. And this was, a big surprise. And my husband and I wrote one question per wing for each kid. And they weren't questions that were meant to like really expose, you know, chip away at their privacy or embarrass them. They were questions like, you know, which of your parents do you think you resemble more and why in terms of temperament? What, which of your grandparents do you think you resemble most and why? Um, these questions that were really about who we are as human beings and how we could get to know our kids better. And it was so much fun. We ended up basically just drinking um, liquefied ice cream towards the end <laughs> because it was so hot, but we had so much fun. And it led to just some really cool conversations, but there are lots of ways to create those opportunities Absolutely. with your kids, but it requires that you actually kind of know your kids and what your kids exactly. will open up to. 
Exactly. Whether that's basketball, whether that's a road trip, whether that's whatever, you know, and that again, as you know, goes back to brain science. Like if you're sitting, staring them in the face, you know, making, saying you need to make eye contact with Mm -hmm. them and that immediately shuts the brain down and sends them into panic mode. And so how can you create these opportunities? Yeah. Well, and so I ask a lot of friends of mine who are therapists, clinicians who work with kids, uh, school counselors, um, you know, you mentioned sports or basketball, you know, if it's, if your kid is a huge basketball player, maybe play a game of horse. And for each one, instead of the word horse, you're dealing with a question per or whatever. Um, you know, there's that whole idea of parallel conversations where you're not looking at each other, but you're sitting next to each other, whether that's in a car, on a chairlift, on a couch, whatever, there are ways to have conversations that are less threatening. Um, there's all kinds of tricks. I tried to include everyone that I could come up with. And actually, I really relied on kids to give me a lot of yes. the answers. And yes. so there's a, my favorite section of the book really came from teens. I asked teens to tell me what excuses they could use if they were out at a party or out with friends and they didn't necessarily want to partake in drugs and alcohol. What kind of excuses can you make that will help you save face that don't make you look like a big dork. And there's two and a half pages of those. And, um, it was, I, kids are so resourceful. They're so amazing. They're so, um, and if we ask them these questions, they tend to really, uh, come through with some really cool answers. So two and a half pages of excuses kids can use when they're out and about, if they don't want to feel like a total. Because when we were younger, we were told to just say no. Right. right. And exactly. Like, we Which we know that, doesn't like, work. That doesn't work. Right. <laughs> doesn't exactly. Work. No. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to end on a note that every time I do a parent or a, a caregiver meeting and we're talking about norms and having conversations around alcohol and we suggest zero tolerance, mm-hmm. there's always pushback. Oh yes. So much that, now, not just that, but that whole, the reasons, the myths that they buy into yes, that go along with that idea of here's yes. why zero tolerance won't work. And they're myths. Right. right, exactly. And this is what they do in Italy. They start mm-hmm. drinking at 14. And well, if I take the keys away, that'll somehow mm-hmm. make it safer. Yeah. And I don't want, I want them to come to me. I don't want them to feel like, but you say pretty unequivocally that zero tolerance is the way to go. Parents, we know from the research that parents that have a consistent and clear message of no, not until it is legal for you. And I put a little asterisk next to that because legal for me, I care more about brain development. So of course, since we know that the adolescent brain is not done developing until the early to mid twenties, you know, if we can get them to 21, if we can get them to 18 or 21. So if a kid starts drinking or whatever using in when they're in eighth grade, they have about a 50% chance of having substance use disorder during their lifetime. If we get them to like, um, if we get them to like 10th grade, it falls considerably. And if we can get them to 18 or 21, we can get it all the way down to 10%, which is what we kind of understand the people with substance use disorder incidents to be in the general population. So it is incredibly important that we are getting kids as close to that completed brain development uh, place as possible. Um, and we know that it's that clear and consistent message of no, not until it is legal for you. And also the information that kids need in order to understand why we're saying that. It's not Correct. because I'm a jerk. It's not because I'm inflexible. It's not because I want other people. I, I think I'm being judged for my parent, whatever. It's because we know that drugs and alcohol do a lot more damage to an adolescent brain than they do to a fully developed adult brain. And again, in the book, I give lots and lots of, you know, research studies around that. And it's saying this is not acceptable and here's why. And it also does not mean, and you, you say this, it also does not mean that you like will disown your child, (laughs) right? (laughs) Right. If they break your rule. I mean, a huge part of your book, the addiction inoculation is that adults, positive role models, adults, whether that's a coach, whether that's a pastor, whether that's a, you know, a scout leader or whatever, that it is our job. It is Mm -hmm. our responsibility to continue to 
protect kids and mm-hmm. inoculate them. And so you're not saying you broke a rule, zero tolerance. I don't ever want to speak to you again. Right. It's, it is being firm and consistent and setting those expectations and then following through on them. Well, and now we're back to gift of failure, which is you make a mistake. Okay. What can we learn from that mistake? Because right. if we can learn something from it, then there is value in that experience. And, you know, I talk about this all the time about relapse, you know, relapse, just because you relapse in recovery does not mean that you're spoiled or dirty or, you know, it's, it's not, it's not ruined. What are you learning about, you know, the signs and signals that sort of led you to that relapse and how can we um, prevent that in the future? And by the way, I want to sneak this in that European myth, that whole, you know, well, look, in Europe, they have sips and they have their own glass and blah, 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 blah. We really, really need to stop holding Europe up as like this bastion of healthy drinking because the European, the European Union as a whole has the highest, the highest levels of, um, alcohol consumption in the entire world. This is data that comes from the World Health Organization. And with a couple of exceptions, and interestingly, the exceptions to that rule have to do with community standards, community mores around acceptability of um, sort of public intoxication, that there are a couple of countries in Europe where it's just not cool to be publicly intoxicated. And those are the countries with lower levels of consumption. But holding Europe, like, first of all, we think that we can like give our kids sips and that they'll somehow learn moderation. It won't be as much of a big deal when suddenly they have it everywhere in college or something like that. A people who are susceptible to substance use disorder cannot learn moderation. I can't learn moderation around alcohol. I just can't. And number two, as I mentioned, if we're holding Europe up as this like, you know, wonderful place, um, uh, utopian place where kids don't drink too much, that's just not true. Um, it is absolutely 100% a myth and we need to, we need to get rid of that one and the whole, you know, well, they might as well do it in my basement and I'll take the keys away. That way everyone will be safe. That is giving a permissive attitude around substance use, not only for your own children, but for those other children and PS aiding and abetting those other children. Think, is that, illegal. That's, that's a felony. Yes. Yeah, that's illegal. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and that is giving a message of permissiveness around drug and alcohol use. And what we know is um, uh, an attitude of permissiveness around drug and alcohol use. So the children of those adults will have higher levels of substance use disorder during their lifetime. Yeah. I could seriously talk to you all day because <laughs> I seriously, as I was reading this, I mean, I have so many more things bookmarked and so many, I was like, yes, it's funny because I was even reading this book and, um, my, my, uh, stepkid, she was like, wow, you're really liking this book. And I was like, yes, I am. Like, this is what, I, the, this is what we are saying. And it's, it's really refreshing, I would say, how you talk about these things in a, it, it, I, I keep saying the word approachable, but I, mm-hmm. I don't know the, a better way to say it because I think that any, any kid uh, or anybody who has a kid in their life should read this book. It's a very easy read. Um, it's not dense at all. When I first looked at it, I was like, ooh, this might, this, I might have bitten off more than I can chew here, but it's very easy read. Um, and it's funny and it's hard. Thank you. It, Thank it you. It really is. I actually had hoped that the word, uh, humor could somehow end up in the, dis- in the description of the book. And yet, uh, editors were like, oh, you can't humor. No one will believe that this, you know, blah, 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 whatever. But, you know, my job is to talk about whether it's gift of failure or addiction inoculation. My job, whether it's writing or speaking, is to go into a a place and talk about into someone's head, into a school and talk about a difficult thing. And I can't do that without copying to all the mistakes I made and without having expressing a large, uh, a, a lot of humor around it. Because, I don't know, maybe that's just how I was raised, but you know, humor is a very important part of getting into difficult conversations. So I, I hope I'm so grateful to you. Anytime an author sees someone holding their book and they have post-it notes sticking out of it everywhere, it just warms our hearts. So thank you so, so much for expressing that about my work. It really means a lot to me. Well, thank you for writing this. Thank you for agreeing to be on, uh, this podcast. Um, I, hope that this is certainly not the end of our relationship. And I I cannot wait to see what is next for you, whatever that looks like. So thank you so much for being on today. Thank you.
If you like what you're hearing, if you want to learn more about Jessica's book, please consider rating, reviewing, and subscribing to The Preventable. Have a wonderful day. Thanks for joining us at The Preventable, brought to you ad-free by Prevent Ed. Prevent Ed works to reduce or prevent the harms of alcohol and other drug use through education, intervention, and advocacy. Please visit their website at prevented.org. Like what you heard? Rate, review, and subscribe to stay up to date with what we are serving on The Preventable.